Got a question? Ask Tom on Home Show Radio. This is Home Show Radio live on Facebook and YouTube. Your questions, Tom's answers. Now here's Tom Tynan and Charlie Mosier. And that means we got to start talking and acting and not anything but walking here at Ask Tom Live. Because if I walk, then you won't see me. You know, I won't be in front of the camera. So this is not live action movie, but this is home improvements to the max. Energy uh, infused with wonderful information for you if you are a homeowner. I'm Tom Tynan. I answer people's questions. I've been in the construction business, goodness, all my life from when I was a little kid, from what I can remember. And that's all I've been doing is helping people and building things. That's my life pretty much in a nutshell. But if you want to be a part of this show, you can certainly ask some questions here on our live broadcast. Or you can always listen to me on Sports Radio 610 in Houston, Texas, or on our website, homeshowradio.com. I'm on Saturdays 9 to noon and Sundays 8 to 11, as well as our very special uh, warm, warm up person, the person that comes before me, our, our pre act, you might say. I don't know if I got any of those right, but it's Danny Milliken from the Garden Pro. And when it comes to gardening, Nobody knows more, and he's going to be with us today also. And Charlie's somewhere in the background. I'm not sure where he's hiding right now. There he is. EC bus. Yeah, we've got a lot to cover today, too. We've got uh, not only Tom and I here to help you. And by the way, just remember, we're here, <clears throat> we're here live. <clears throat> and trained professionals, as you can tell. Um, but if, Old uh, man flem. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> if you got questions, we want to help you about projects you're working on, you're, you're stumped. Tom's the guy to ask. He's the guy, the builder has been at it for uh, forever, and he's got a lot of experience and helps people. He's been doing it on the radio for over 30 years, and he can help you out. But for you, all you got to do is put your questions in the comment section underneath. They'll pop up here, and uh, we'll share them and answer them. Plus, we have some that we've taken from our website, from homeshowradio.com. We also, today, Tom, it's the last Thursday of the month, and before the month swills down the drain, we always reach out to somebody. It reminds us, it's as the month goes down the drain, to reach out to Danny Milliken to be with us. Danny, hey, going down the drain. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm hey, back I think up your plant's drain. dying behind you. <laughs> it's fine. It's what fine, is, okay. Hey, um, it's I like fine. to think of the show as the Kid Brother Show to Home Show <laughs> the, kid brother like show. the Kid Brother Show. Little, well, you are the buddies. youngest one in the room, and you have hair on your face and your head. Charlie has a goatee and a really nice head of hair. <laughs> yeah, but you're the youngest yeah. one in the room. Right. Okay, that's fine. I, I might wager that. And you're not th- white haired yet. Right. Hair Tom, I point. might wager of the three of us, I have the most hair. <laughs> oh. Oh, but is it's that a body comment? Hair. Is that a- yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's right. It's a follicle taunt right at you there. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's a- well, I am going off of this topic. <laughs> so we will. Yeah, that's right. So, Danny, you hang on. We'll be back with you in a couple minutes. And Danny will be here. He's going to answer some gardening questions along with our home improvement questions. So you got questions about your garden. You got questions about your home or whatever. Go ahead and put them in down in there and we'll be able to help you out this morning. Tom, as uh, last week, we started our brand new What's News section here. We're going to cover ah. something here today that might be of interest. What do we got? Well, this past week, um, they, they had, there's a new report that just came out from a housing research company called Zonda Media. They put this thing out every year, and it's their um, return on investment report that comes out every year on what the 12... What, what all the top return on investment improvements you can make around your house is. And 11 of the top 12 are all exterior home improvements, with the exception of one interior one in the top 12. And I'm not going to ask you to guess which one it is, but it, it's probably the most obvious in, in return on investment improvement you can make inside your home. You want to guess? Okay. Well, are you talking about, it depends on the scope of the project. If you're talking about right. a major room remodel, I'm going to assume it's a kitchen. Kitchens you are correct, sir. Okay, you are you. correct. That's pretty steady. They don't need a whole Zonda right. thing to do that. It's been around forever. Well, sure. But, you know, so here, here are the top, some of the top categories they had in this report that came out this year, right? And they said the overall return on investment is about 60%, which is down 
from their last round in uh, 2014 of 71 percent. So the return on investment has gone down a little, Tom, and I think that probably has a lot to do with the pressure on the inventory that's going on with houses mm -hmm. out there. Listen, people are buying above market value for almost anything right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they just need something, whether they're going to remodel it or not. If mm -hmm. it's in the right location and they see some kind of potential, they won't wait to see four more or five more. They're going to say, here's, here's the bid on it right now. It is that crazy when it comes to selling properties right now. I'm about to put one on the market next month, and I already have been getting tons of letters and people are I haven't even put it officially on the market and they're starting to bid up and bid up and this one needs a total rehab I'm not going to do a thing but as is and it's still going to go above the taxable value in Dallas Texas oh, it just astounds okay. me right now okay I thought maybe it was up in in Heath in Heathwick I was like oh, I hope not Heathwick where's that <laughs> or wherever Heath, what is Huntwick. It? Huntwick Huntwick it. he'll yell at the so. microphone <laughs> Huntwick no, if I could get, I, if I, I might. I, that one's not right. ruled out yet, but Dallas is first. Well, here are the top five return on investments that came out. There. And this one always comes out number one. It's always the garage door. And I uh, find that amazing. Yeah. Because it's return on investment. Right. Return on investment. See, somebody's going to give you more money for your house. And to be a garage door, I don't know who would think that would be a reason to buy a house for more money. I think it. I think it has a lot to do with the fact of the, well. Look at the cost cost to return ratio on there, right? The, it, mm -hmm. How cheap a garage door is compared with say uh, a roofing replacement, right? So that so it's it kind of if you're looking at percentages, it's really the percentages work in the door's favor. But here's one for you. What do you suppose, Tom, was the one uh, percentage wise had the least return on investment in their survey? This one may surprise yeah, so you. I don't even know what to pick from. Like okay. Windows, maybe? Master Suite Edition. If you do an oh, addition, to your, addition? Okay. An addition yeah. to your Master Suite, they say that's the one that gives you the least return on investment. Yeah. Which is great news, because Sandy and I are in the middle of one. <laughs> now I know where this is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, if you are curious at all and you'd like to paw through this thing anymore, you go to uh, zondamedia.com is where you can find uh, find that report and look on it. Next week, we are going to have some, da some data we've got from Redfin about some of the most unbelievable statistics of home resale going on right now. That's what we'll have next week in our little... I bet you it is amazing. What's news? Whatever's going on. Yeah. Oh, it's bizarre. It is. All yeah. right. So here we go. Let's get into some questions, Tom. I've got one here that's just come into us from uh, from our buddy, Jimmy John. He's always here coming for us, right? Thank and you, actually, Jimmy. this one is for, for, for Danny. So let's bring Danny up. Let me bring his question back up here. Hi, Danny. Danny. <laughs> he, he wants to know, um, I have a Meyer lemon tree in a container. And after the rains, I noticed these pustule looking things on the stems leading up to each lemon. Are they plant zits? Do I need to pop them? They're yellow, round, or something like that. What say you? Was that picture of the problem, or is that the lock? No, no, no. That's his picture. No, he's got Delhi. Okay. Back up okay. Here. Great. Great. No, cool. I think well, no I think what that is is that was uh, the Loch Ness oh. monster uh, swimming <laughs> through a subdivision monster. during uh, during Harvey. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay, good. Clarifying. Thank you for the clarifying. So I'm not yeah, sure exactly so. what he's got going on. I mean, anytime we've got any bark kind of change or anything happening in the bark, that's a really a really bad sign. Uh, as most of you probably know, the, the uh, blood flow in a tree happens just under the bark. So the xylem and phloem there are where all that happens. And so if there's bark damage, that usually means that there's kind of like blood vessel damage, um, if we think of human terms. But so anytime you got something going on uh, near the fruit, under the bark, honestly, I would uh, I would probably get some compost around the base and try to treat it with a root inoculant, something like Dakota Rev or Super Seaweed, something like that that's gonna push growth because you wanna get um, as much new nutrients up into the branches as possible. It sounds like he's got lemon production didn't that sound like to you that there's lemon production? Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like, like he, he said, some, yeah. yeah. He wa he's what wondering if it's some you? kind of scale or something he's got to deal with. Oh, you know, I bet that's what it is. I bet that's what it is. Each of those pustules 
is probably that's, a scale. So that's a little insect. Yeah, sometimes the way people little, uh, explain these things, they need to be careful. <laughs> okay. The scale make a little protective shell. And so what you do is you get your, uh, your pressure washer out and citrus can take it. So just blast them, blast the pressure washer on there and then really? follow up with some molasses. That's what I always suggest. It'll actually remove the scale and it won't, they won't come back. So molasses on the ground. No, no, on the plant itself, like a foliar oh, really? treatment yeah. with horticultural okay, brush it on? molasses. Uh, yeah, if you no, got use a, a sprayer. A sprayer. <laughs> okay. Oh. Brush it. Yeah, there's hose-in sprayers. That's a great tool for a gardener. Just uh, It's like got a little container. You put your liquid mm -hmm. in there, and then the pressure okay. mixes it for you. Oh, do you mean like we, we, the, we put the molasses down when we were doing the um, the sod webworm thing that you had us do? Yeah. Okay, the same yes, kind. Yes, exactly. All right. All right. I know yeah. I know that I couldn't possibly know as much as Tom. That's why I'm the foil for his humor on these things. Well, I had 13 fruit trees until Mother Nature killed them all during the freeze. <laughs> so Danny has been like spraying molasses on them for, for a long time. Yeah, do you have a question for Danny then about your trees, Tom? He ripped them all out. No, because I, I just planted two Meyer lemons. But I think we have a question coming up about apples that I'm going to listen to. Am I not correct with that? Yeah. We do have an Apple question coming. In so fact, instead uh, of getting the answer twice, I'm going to wait for that question to come up because I'm going to listen intently. Fair enough. Say hi to uh, Craig and Mary and Bubba. He's here. Hey, and guys. Kevin. Glad y'all are here. I'm wondering if this Kevin, there's a Kevin that's watching. Kevin mm. McGee. I'm wondering if that's a guy I used to go to high school with up in New Hampshire. He seems to have nothing else to do, so he's watching the show here this afternoon. So Kevin. Oh, the fight now, of course. Up there. there it is. All right. So let's get to a question for you, Tom. This comes from the uh, Ask Tom box here at homeshowradio.com. Yes. This is from John in Southwest, and he wants to know um, how common is the cracking or broken sewer pipe under the foundations in Houston, and what can cause this problem? Well, the, the, the piece of the puzzle I don't have is what year the house was built. If the house was built in the 50s, early 60s, big problem so very very common at the age of the home it is it is now because those were cast iron pipes and they rot away it's not broken or cracked but they'll just start to deteriorate in the ground over all those years so in that sense it's very common if it's a newer home let's say built in the last 25 years not very common at all because it was all schedule 40 pvc and for that to crack or break would be very rare because it is such a strong pipe now, in the early 80s and late 70s, they used a black type pipe, which was kind of like, it wasn't a Schedule 40. I'm not sure what the schedule number on it was. It was used for a very short period, and they got kind of brittle, and some of those would crack. But I wouldn't say it's super common, but it's more common than the Schedule 40 and not as common as the old uh, uh, cast iron pipe that you saw back in the 50s and early 60s into the late 60s. So the cause, I mean, obviously the causes will vary depending on the type of pipe, which varies by yep. the age of the house and all that. Uh, I guess in, in a lot of cases, the, the ones we're hearing about are the older ones that are, that are, that I'm going to assume so. And through. if it's the, mm -hmm. if, if it's a cast iron pipe, it's just because it finally is rotting away. The walls get so thin mm -hmm. because it just rusts away from the outside and the inside that eventually the, usually the bottom of the pipe where the water uh, flows through, it just eats it away and gets so thin that it'll start to develop holes. Not really cracks, but holes, and it'll start to pull mud up into it and do different things like that and dump water in the ground where a lot of people, uh, like our uh, certified Home Show Pro Due West Foundation Repair, finds a lot of the problems in the older homes because all that water went into that expansive soil and the soils expanded. Now, the black pipe that was used for a while, that would have to be some kind of big tree root or something like that some kind of movement to put so much pressure on there it would go up down or eventually crack trying to fight whatever mm -hmm. was pushing it around the schedule 40 the white pipe that people know when they go into the home depots and lows now that pipe sometimes will get a belly and then you'll get backups but it won't usually create a crack or a hole and either one of them any one of those situations tom it, are they all eligible or qual will they all respond the same way to the, the cured in place pipe repair that say TDT does? Not all of them, no, it depends. If you get the, the cast iron pipe, would you have the sweeps coming down in the ground from the toilets 
You have the P-traps underneath the showers that are built just down in the dirt. You can't really fix those. You have to literally dig in under the house, tunnel under there, and replace all the underground plumbing. And it can be quite extensive. Now, if it's a, a tree root or something that cracked it, or it depends, and you always have to have them come out and take a look at it. If it's a straight run and it just had some weird thing where it broke, then they could probably do that. But the old cast iron pipes that are rotting away, if it's real severe, it's gonna be more than just mm -hmm. putting a cast in place piece because they have so many joints and bends and turns, that's where it gets difficult. Mm -hmm. You remember you told me how the uh, people came out and rewired your internet and got the problems all fixed? Yes. No, yeah. I didn't. They're still working on it. Yeah. Well, apparently so. They may be working on it right now. Anyway. They're supposed to be working on it all week, actually. Well, they all, they, they're rewiring the entire neighborhood. They're running out of week. Or is this like, we're like the 16th week of our eight-week bathroom remodel right now. So maybe uh, it's one of those one-week projects like that. Oh. Uh, I got, by the way. working on it. I don't think I told you the exciting news. That my birthday was on Tuesday. Well, I knew that. You know what I got for my birthday? No. I got a brand new underground utility service installation to my house. It was fantastic. Well, we woke up you at know, my birthday's in the coming up. Maybe I'll get an internet service to mine for my birthday. <laughs> it could happen. Yeah. We woke up, we woke up at about 4.20 in the morning and Sandy said the generator's on. Now, you can't hear it from where we are. But apparently the fan changed speed in the room and that woke her up. And um, oh, yeah. yeah. And so we come to find out that the low voltage line was the of the two lines coming. One of them was off and had to be replaced. And then that wasn't enough. I, I like to do it right. So we also had to replace both our panels on the house. So it was fantastic. Yo. Happy birthday. Really? Yeah, yeah oh, no yeah. kidding. I'm glad you found panels because right now some of them are 16 months out. You can't even get your hands on them. So well, I'm glad I know. That, uh, I know. I'm sure, people. Will got them for you. Yeah, I, know I know people. Too, so. In fact, you can know yeah. people too. Let us visit homeshowradio.com and wait a second. I scroll down and see right there. It says Right Touch Electrical. That's the guy. Yeah. Anyway, so they can they can help you out anytime if you're looking for a pro. So hey, speaking of pro, we got a pro on board and he's sitting there picking his nose. So let's see if I can catch him on camera. Nope, he stopped. All right, we. Got Danny, I got Yo, a question Danny. for you. Here comes one from uh, Marion in South Houston. She says, can I trim my two large giant oak trees now in May? Yes. Thank you, Danny. All, All right, right, Danny. Danny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, That's wow. what I'm doing Good. the show this weekend. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> though. Honestly, though, I would avoid uh, any major pruning in May on oak trees. You generally want to do that when it's cool, when there's very little stress on the tree. So March, February um, for live oaks. And then depending if it's a deciduous oak, I just have an oak right out the window I'm looking at. But um, if it's a deciduous tree, then right before it leaves back out. So again, you know, early, early February, late January. May is not our time for a big remodel or a big uh, trimming of that tree. Just keep that in mind. The whole idea of doing a big pruning before hurricane season is pretty overblown. Uh, the, a nice thick canopy is the thing that can protect you best against winds because it's made to resist winds. If you open up that canopy, you can really kind of get winds coming through the backside of the canopy or underneath the canopy. And that's when you get really damage, um, big limb damage. So just keep that in mind is, is hurricane pruning is really not that, that, uh, big of a thing. Yeah, I've heard that said that you know, for years that was the thing. You want to go get your trees all thinned out for the hurricane, and that's not the fact. No, it's a little scary to think about it. I mean, it, the tree spends all of its life growing up in these high winds, and it's made kind of a helmet, if you will, in that canopy shape to resist it. And you change that shape or you open it up, the wind's coming from inside the canopy, and that can really break a branch or, a, or topple a tree. So. Mm -hmm. Be very careful. What about pruning in general? I mean, is this an okay time of year to like you want to prune back stuff or do you want to wait till the end of the season or? Yeah, great question. Um, that's a great question. So that does differ for all plants. So a lot of like shrubby flowering plants, you can do a little shearing. So you're just taking off the top, you know, two, three inches around the whole thing. 
almost like you're reshaping it. The cool thing that that'll do is get you a whole new flush of flowers. So um, things like Hamelia or Lantana, things like that that you may have growing for the butterflies, you can give it a little kind of re 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 give it a little haircut there, um, get it a retrim, very small shear, and that will really help the plant a lot. So, but on these bigger plants, just kind of let them go until next season. So you can cut off a small branch here and there, but a big pruning, I would be very careful with a large giant. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is a giant oak tree, but it's a large giant. So it's like one of the bigger oak trees we've probably ever seen. Hmm. Okay. So I got one here for you from Jack. He's uh, one of our regulars. Jack's good to have you with us here today. Um, he says, I've got this weird fungus shedding on the barks of both my fruit trees and oak trees. Both look the same. It's like a light gray color and looks like feathers coming out of the bark. What is that and how do I treat it? He says it's the first time he's ever seen it. Okay, so it's one of two things. Um, one is a lichen. Uh, and the, a lichen is a very kind of prehistoric plant. It's not a plant, it's not a fungi, but it does grow on bark, and it's one of the very few things that can grow on both a citrus and an oak. And they're, they're generally not doing a whole lot. They're kind of delving into the very top layer, but for an anchor, they, um, they're gonna get some minerals, but they're really getting everything they can from the air. And so I wouldn't worry too much about that. If it's really bothering you, um, just you know, pick it off or scrape it off with something, or if you know, you want to blast it off with that pressure washer, you're welcome to do it. The other thing that can kind of look like feathers um, is a kind of caterpillar called woolly bear and it's, or asp. Um, it's a very painful caterpillar. It looks just like a feather. Uh, if you see it growing on a tree and, you know, before you touch it, poke it with a stick to make sure it's not, because this is like people have gone to the hospital because these things hurt so much. So it's just the asp caterpillar, a little gray caterpillar that looks just like a feather. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I went out um, a couple of weeks ago uh, on a little photo safari out to uh, Joshua Tree National Park. Oh, cool. So it's one of the dark sky national parks. We were taking pictures of the astral stuff overhead. And uh, we saw cacti out there, this big field of cactus. is a cactus garden out there. And it was one of these things you walk through it, and it's like, you, you just get near them, and it's like those things will jump out. <laughs> you know, the, the, the things will... Oh, wow. You, <clears throat> you have to keep a distance. And then we did real good keeping off. We got back to the car, and we look at our shoes. Our shoes are like furry from all the ones that our shoes had picked up. We had to spend time pulling them out of our shoes before we came in, so... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we don't... Luckily, we don't have those around here, right, Tom? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Not right. a big fan that of That is cactus. lucky. Yeah. All right. So I uh, got one other one from the Ask Tom box for you, Tom. Here comes one from, uh, uh, oh, that's John. We already got John. Yeah, here. We already John. got him. Barb from the Woodlands says, our house was built with a recirculating pump and the freeze this year killed the 17-year-old pump. And I voted we replace it because we have to wait too long for hot water. And it seems so wasteful letting it run. But my husband was told by a friend that the pumps are a fire hazard and are not necessary. <laughs> Any thoughts? I hate wasting water and money, but I'm tired of cold showers, she says. I think the friend needs to get someone something else to do. Uh, no, it's not a fire issue at all. So here's what we got. Uh, replace the pump. No fire issue. Fix everything the way it was, and you'll be fine. Simple answer on this one. Those recirculating pumps are great because, you know, it means... Yeah, I've never heard of one starting on fire in my whole career. <laughs> no. So. no. But, but you know, and, and you can't you put them on a timer, too, so they're not even running all the time? Of course. Or you can even put them on a button where you, you touch the button and within 15 seconds it recirculates everything and you're ready to turn the water on. So there's lots of ways to put them in, and I think she was probably really happy with the way it worked before the freeze. And so I would say, call Abacus Plumbing if you're in Houston, replace it or whoever your plumber is and get it back in line. There's no fire hazards and something doesn't sound right with that story. Somebody's trying to save a dollar. Uh, yeah, 
wonder if her, her <laughs> husband put somebody up to that. Yes. Yeah, ju- just tell her it'll start a fire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, you That's know, we, all I got to say about that. And by the way, if you got <laughs> questions, you want to put something, go ahead and put them in the bin down below and uh, in the comment section, and we'll do it. And look, we got one right here. And Tom, this is something maybe you can help uh, Danny with. He says, a guy named Chad writes into us, Danny's closet door Looks like it's falling off the hinges. Tom, who should he call to fix something like that? Ooh, I didn't notice that. That doesn't look good, Danny. He doesn't care. (laughs) Okay, Danny, here's what the plan is. We need a big pot and a tall tree that will cover the door. Mm, Nice. Fixed. There we go. I just bought some door hinges and I just need to uh, (laughs) put it on there. I love it when people say, I bought the hinges. When did you buy them? It was about six months ago. (laughs) That's great. Yay. Before the freeze. (laughs) Halfway there. Right. Or or the ones like, we've had the guy out to fix it six times. (laughs) Yeah. He fixed it and then it wasn't right. It was broken again. Right. Exactly. All right, Danny, here's another one for you. Um, (laughs) Steve in Siena Plantation says, I'm looking for an organic, non-toxic option for protecting my young apple trees from insects. Any suggestions for it? Absolutely. This is one of those uh, questions that a lot of people think that they have to protect their insects with a spray from the outside. And nothing is going to work better than great soil, and thriving roots and with an apple tree the way to avoid the other side of that kind of poor roots poor growing roots is by planting it too deep Uh, if you plant your apple tree too deep you will get insects on it Um, you'll get anything from white fly to um, plum curcillo to a lot of different things aphids all over the place if you plant it too deep and so if you've got a young tree like that you want to make sure it's a couple inches above the ground around it and just keep that mounted up with compost because that's the other way to build plant resilience, all the plants out there have a really natural resilience to insect pests, to disease pressure, and the best way to do it is to improve their soil. So this has kind of been practiced and over and over by NASA on the space station. If they want healthier plants, they improve the soil. And so they're growing vegetables up there, which is really cool, not apples yet. Um, and so if you're really worried about a, a current infestation, two-step thing, compost around the roots, and then, you know, get some mass, some molasses all over the leaves. So molasses and another thing called horticultural oil, uh, those two kind of taking turns every other month will really keep bugs off. But you don't even have to do that if you're just really focusing on, on soil health. You're, you're taking notes, Tom? I, man, it was beautiful. He's yes. not. I can see, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, he's on the screen right there. Not yeah. writing anything. He's actually watching. He's trying to catch up on his TikTok <laughs> videos right now. Yeah. Oh, nice. Like, jeez. No. But, yeah, I hear you talk about that. I mean, if, the, if I, 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 it's like, could be a drinking game listening to you on the radio. It how really many, t- how long is it going to be before <laughs> Danny says the word compost? And it's not very long. <laughs> not long. All those, all those 7 to 9 a.m. Saturday morning heavy drinkers will absolutely love this. That's be, it. Well, you know, except it's yeah. it's, it's a <laughs> coffee drinking game, so it's like you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, I so, finished my coffee. No, but seriously, you you talk about this a lot about how soil health is so important. Expand on that. What? Why? Because, I mean, it, it makes sense when when you've heard the show. But if somebody is unaccompanied, sure. un, un, infamili- unfamiliar with it, I had a little trouble with the nouns and verbs here today. Um, <laughs> explain why that is. Well, if we think of all the things that we do to encourage plant growth, right? Um, we water, we put down nitrogen fertilizer, we put down mineral packs, we till the soil, we aerate the soil, we do all these things. Well, when it comes down to it, um, what? who does that for the old growth forests? You know, who does that for the native grasslands? Like, nobody's doing that. The, the biome in the soil, the actual microbial life that our earthworm food is kind of what it is, they are stirring the soil up, they're mining resources to bring to the plant, and they're adding tons of nitrogen in their body. And so everything that we really need to get out of the soil, we can provide by compost, because compost is this very nitrogen rich, very carbon rich, um, living material that we can put down. And so it's such a great thing to do because it opens up the soil. You, you're aerating out there with your machine, 
You know, if you're out there doing it today, you're sweating like crazy um, and you're not doing half the job that just a compost top dressing could do. So um, nobody tills soil better than earthworms. Earthworms eat bacteria, so mm -hmm. I should add bacteria. I mean, it kind of adds some sense to it. There's also no element, I mean, no creature on the planet that has more nitrogen than bacteria. And so if, if I can add this one thing that tills the soil and nitrogen fertilizes, I should do that. And that's where compost comes in because compost is very uh, bacteria rich. I, I, we have a lot of questions I want to get to, but I just want to ask you, so that's how I air up my soil. What about these machines that supposedly aerate my soil? Is that is that a bad way to aerate? Um, generally, that is an effective way to aerate for about two weeks. And so after two weeks, most of that functionality, functional aeration is, is gone. And so does that answer your question? Well, it does it. So, so is it's it a actually great thing damaging? to do for two weeks. Is it is it going to no. damage all that community that you're building in the soil then? No, um, it's not going to help it. It kind of just adds air to space that didn't have air. And air is great because it has oxygen in it and it has carbon. And those little uh, entities in there do like the oxygen that's in the air. Mm -hmm. And now the thing about it is that we aerate, we're making little holes in the soil, and ideally we're putting something into it like compost. And then when we do that, it's really a lot more beneficial than just aerating because um, all you're doing is kind of compacting it. And, you know, another thing, if you listen to the show all the time, we have somebody calls in with a lawn question. They're dealing with compaction. You know, they've got Virginia buttonweed or dichondra or dollarweed. Mm -hmm. It's almost universally compaction. Their St. Augustine is kind of struggling to uh, grow. Compaction. Fungal problems. Compaction. So another thing, what, what helps with compaction the most? Compost top dressing. <laughs> so it's just like, it really is kind of funny because mm -hmm. if you've got good compost, you can do a lot uh, of, of kind of repair outside. Well, speaking of compaction, Tom, here's one for you about foundations. I don't know. Ooh. Wait, my phone's ringing. <laughs> oh, very important call. Hang on, folks. I wonder who Hello. it is. Hello. Goodbye. Okay. I'm back. Oh, okay. Great. All right. <laughs> Mr. President, I'll have to get back to you. Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Sell. Here's JD in Sugarland. Says, I have a water leak in my foundation. Should I hire a leak detection company to pinpoint where the leak is? or have someone isolate the leak by cutting holes in sheetrock. What's the most cost-effective solution for this, Tom? I don't understand where <laughs> sheetrock and foundation leaks would connect, but maybe you do. Exactly right. No, that's that's what I'm looking at this. It depends where the hole is. If you need to cut some sheetrock because uh, you have a hole in your pipe and a wall, then yeah, you, you'd cut the sheetrock. It'd be very cost-effective. But if it's in the foundation and you're cutting holes in your sheetrock, it's probably not going to be very effective. Uh, the bottom line is, is you got to get a plumber in there to find out where the leak is. And they have ways of doing it. It's not a leak detection company. That's if you have a swimming pool or something and it's leaking out in the yard and you can't figure out where it's going. Those are the kind of leaks they look for uh, in, in industrial situations. But when it comes to uh, just a, a home under slab, then you know what? You're going to have to get a plumber to, to isolate where the leak is and then move the pipes around. I can tell you this under a slab, it should have no joints. It should go from point A to point B with one, usually a copper tube that has no joints in it. And then when it comes through the slab, if there's a leak, it's usually right there where it's coming through the slab if you get a leak at all. So if it's truly under a foundation and it's a supply line, then you gotta call a plumber. If it's a drain line, then the plumber will do a different test. It's called a hydrostatic test where they'll fill the drains with water put a clear riser out in the yard and see if it goes down. And then they can run a camera in it to find out where that leak might be. First, they make sure it is a leak, and then they'll run a camera to find it. But as far as supply lines, it's troubleshooting it, but a leak detection company is not the answer. And just cutting holes in the wall doesn't make sense either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, we have, I mean, in the, I mean, we have people who've built entire businesses on leak detection. But at the end of the day, you want the guy fixing the foundation to be fine in that if there is, an, in fact, a leak. Under if the it's ground. under the ground and there's a foundation problem, like mm -hmm. Dewest, they'll tunnel under there. They'll sure. support the foundation. They'll replumb everything mm -hmm. and then reef backfill it and it's done. It's sure. expensive. But unfortunately, it has to be fixed. 
But the fact of the matter, should I go under the ground or start hitting, uh, putting holes in the sheetrock, that's kind of a weird question because you have mm -hmm. to get to the leak. So find the leak first and then decide whether you have to put holes in the sheetrock or you have to dig a uh, hole. Man, that was a birthday present a couple of years ago. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. I love my birthday presents. It's awesome. Yes. So, all right. Danny, I got one more for you here, buddy. Hang on a second. Where is it? Here we go. Um, Robert in League City says, what would work best on my lawn? I detached my sprinklers for most of this year. I also went through and put compost on it, as you would have him do. I have been following a strict fertilizer schedule. The lawn is lush and green, but it has been showing signs of a fungus. And I see some yellow and possible gray spots on blades in different parts of the lawn. What say you, Mr. Green? I This is where, if it weren't for this question, I would have kind of rung the lawn alarm already, but we're going to do it now. So you go ahead and, Charlie, hit the alarm button sounder. <laughs> nice. Do you have, there, okay. So that's, oh, that's a heavy hey! little alarm. <laughs> That's the alert, alert. Wait, 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 um, wait hang on a second, wait a second. Would this be a better one here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one, that the clowns good. just came in. Why here it you is. have so many clown noises? There's, that's the lawn so, effect, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, that was it. it, yeah. That was it, the long, lawn alarm has been rung. So freeze, with the freeze and with this rain, we are going to have the nastiest brown patch and a gray leaf spot and fungal problems in the lawn that we've ever, ever had. And so if you're someone who's fertilizing their lawn, whatever you're using, let that be your last bag of the summer and early fall and switch to MicroLife Brown Patch. I'm not kidding, it will save the day. It has an inoculate that actually eats the fungus that is causing your diseases. So you can just go ahead and put something down now start laying it on there. It's also a really great fertilizer. So it's not like you're losing on the fertilizer front. You can literally stymie the fungal problems that you're going to have. This rain is the perfectly timed rain and there was so much of it. And so, man, get out there and get that brown patch and get it out in the lawn. So you can put that down way ahead of it before it starts hip, almost like the whole pre-emergent thing. You're gonna get out and get it before it happens. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know this invading army is coming. And so you're mm -hmm. getting the troops ready, you know, to Tom, you know, Tom knows about it. He's, oh, we know, know all about there. invading armies in Texas. So yeah, we're familiar with this. Oh, that's right. I was going to say, yeah, micro life works. Cause I know all about that. I use it on everything. So yes, yes. it works on everything. And my dogs love it. <laughs> yeah. Our, yeah, our, exactly you look right. at the ingredients, yeah. it's like a, a dog <laughs> yeah. treat list. Yeah. We I have know to it has oregano meal. in it. <laughs> yeah. Does it have oregano in it, Danny? <laughs> I no, think I saw the, regular. That's the Agrilon. Oh, the Agrilon. <laughs> Agrilon. Okay. Oh, no wonder my pizza was tasting funny. Right, yeah, don't you stop using the microwave, Tom. <laughs> that says organic is the word you're reading. All right. Hey, oh, Danny, okay. I appreciate you coming by and being part of the show here this afternoon. Um, are there any uh, general tips for people right now? Like you're saying, we got to protect our lawn right now against the uh, the coming brownness that will be following the freeze and all that. But the good news is we probably won't have sob webworms this year after that freeze. I mean, they are, they do underground um, their eggs. So I'm not too hopeful about that. You know, by the time we have a, a no, no. By I thought, we have the, a big I thought the hard freeze that would, that would do it. And we, we sure had one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, we can hope. We can hope. Yeah, you Charlie, say, yeah. this is, it doesn't <laughs> freeze the ground here deep enough yeah. to hurt anything. Right. Like in, in, in northern climates, to put basements, you have to get below a freeze line. It could be, sure. you know, three feet in the ground. But even when Houston has that freeze, Danny, maybe you can add a little bit, but it might be a top half inch or so that would really be affected down into the dirt. It stays a pretty consistent 76 yeah. degrees so, or right in there. Yeah, so not so even it's enough, hard not to even kill anything far. deep. So we're gonna have we're gonna have brown patch. We're gonna have sod <laughs> yes. web worms. We're gonna have cicadas, gophers, you know, <laughs> feral hogs, dogs we're living with cats. We're definitely gonna have really really bad brown patch. That that I know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. usually you don't have a bad sod web worm year after a bad sod web worm year, um, and that's really that's what we've got going for us. But I just uh, I mean whatever you can do. So you know 
You asked for general tips. Right now, people are really battling tropical armyworms on their tomatoes, a lot of snail and slug damage. And so BT for that, those tomatoes. Um, and while you're spraying your BT, go ahead and put it on the lawn. There's no reason you can't get it out there. You can stymie a first generation of sod webworm if you are worried about that. Um, for the slugs and snails, I've seen a lot of pictures of snail damage and they'll just, they'll, it's kind of like you, you freeze or you suck the life out of a plant is what they do. It's, it's kind of wild. And so Sluggo, uh, a company called Monterey makes this really cool. Same one that makes Consan 20, the Tommy you talk about, but um, they make a great product called Sluggo and it stops slugs and snails and the water does not get rid of it. Like the beer you might put out there. Plus, yeah. like, don't I was going to say that. Budweiser. What about that? Yeah. yeah no it's, Budweiser? It's like 30, so 30 minutes of protection. Put little pie tins out with beer in it. That's what they used to I mean, to just do. drink that. Just drink that. Right. <laughs> oh, we came, we we did that, then we salt. came and found people camping out behind the garage. Okay, we're not doing that <laughs> <Yes>. anymore. <laughs> They're so sipping on the little saucers. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you guys. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. So those are two big ones. Might happen today. So those are two. The last got a third? one is mulch. Yeah, the last one is you got to mulch. Or if you've already mulched, just check your mulch to make sure it's not running out. The worst thing we can do for our gardens is just bare soil. Um, that's when it turns to dirt. Uh, the, the rain, the heat, the sun will all kind of eliminate the protection that it's got. So just keep your mulch mulched, uh, especially for summer. Cool. So we will, so mulch, BT, and the brown bag, Microlife is what you're saying. Yes. Okay, I'm just, okay I Charlie. Wanted I wanted to repeat it in case Sandy hadn't written down. She's probably on her way right now to go get it. But, <laughs> but anyway. But no. Charlie, the new T-shirt. The new T-shirt for Danny is keep your mulch mulched. I like that. Right across the chest. I like that. Or, or That and uh, soil microbes are cool. Or thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank oh, you very thank you much. Very much. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, I like that. All right, All right. All right. Sure Danny, no thank you that. for being here with us this morning, this afternoon, today. Yeah. Whenever, thank you whenever somebody's watching this thing, I mean, and if they're this far into it, God knows they've got nothing to do. But we appreciate <laughs> we appreciate you being with us. And uh, Tommy got a couple more questions. But just in case you want more of what you've just experienced, this is where you want to go. Saturday mornings, you'll find Danny and that retinue of garden gurus gathered around the microphone helping you. They are the Home Show Garden Pros, and they're on the air every Saturday morning from 7 to 9 on Sports Radio 610. Or go to homeshowgardenpros.com, homeshowgardenpros.com. That's where you find Danny. And if you can't find it, go to Home Show Radio. You scroll down. There's a link that will take you over there. But that's the deal. We're that's how I show. listen to it. That's good. That's how I we listen to it. Yeah. We need every click we can get. So I appreciate that, Danny. <laughs> yeah, it'd be awkward if I was listening to it while I was, you know. All right. Well, doing... and I'm looking forward, I guess in July, you're doing your show from Phoenix, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there um, doing some hiking, visiting some family. So that'll be good. I appreciate well, your check commitment. check out all the cacti and boulders. That we can... Appreciate your commitment to doing it, buddy. Thank you so much. And I'm sure everybody in the garden world uh, appreciates you too. And, uh, Look forward to uh, catching you this Saturday on the show. Thanks, Danny. All right. So let's uh, we've got a couple more time for us to, to get through um, some more questions. And then uh, if anybody has some more, they can feel free to put them in because that's why we're here. Here comes one from um, Nicole in Northwest. She says her hot, her water heater pilot keeps going out. What is causing this? I, th I seem to remember you saying something about summer weather causes this problem. Well, if you get into August and, you're, and it's in the attic and the attic is super hot, then the pilot will get uh, starved of oxygen and it'll go out. So people have to put roof vents next to the water heater so it can feed fresh air into it. It can happen in a closet too. But this time of year, that wouldn't be happening at all. There wouldn't be any problem. We're not getting that kind of hot weather. I'm talking about really hot August, early September weather. Right now, if there's just a mechanical problem, it's called the uh, thermal couple. The thermal couple can go bad. It's a small little wire that can be uh, replaced if that's all it is, if the water heater is new enough to justify some mechanical work on it. A plumber can do it for you very easily. Clean the burners, make sure it's all working right. 
but that would be usually the problem is the thermal couple. The bigger problem, if it becomes the gas valve that's full of dirt, most of the time to replace a gas valve on an older water heater, it's time just to get a new one. Rare, but it happens, so they'll have to troubleshoot it. But most, most cases, the thermocouple, which believe it or not, the part itself, well, at one time was about $2.99. Today, it's probably $50,000. But I'm sure it's still more affordable than, say, a 2 by 4 So you should be okay. <laughs> but, but not quite as, as cheap as a uh, length of wire. Because that's the one that, <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's the one that's gone up the most. I think it's like 700%. So. Yeah. In yes. fact... That panel job yesterday cost us also mm. almost a thousand more than they when they quoted it earlier this year. And I think and the reason it was only a thousand dollars, I think Will was at Right Touch was taking good care of us, but um, still. Yeah, and there's going to be a point coming up in the next sixty days where Charlie, you kind of made a joke at the beginning. You know, you knew somebody. Even if you know somebody in about sixty ninety days, when it comes to electrical things like just single pole switches breaker panels, breakers themselves. It doesn't matter who you know. They just will not be available. We're still going to hit rock bottom on that trend, even though the lumber's starting to come down. The electrical uh, uh, devices are going to be an issue, and they will start coming back more uh, mm -hmm. available probably after the first of the year. Well, and I see where um, the, 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 it's a matter of the precious metals and the petroleum and the trucking and all the other challenges that are that's creating this i saw a guy on um, cnbc and the next day i read an article in forbes about this about the supply chain interruptions that have yeah. caused this more than anything else and then on top of that the, the we were already under stress because of all the people staying home from covid and doing projects yeah. around their house that already created escalated demand and then when the economy opened up it exploded and that's why we are where we are in this there's a concept in supply chain management called the bullwhip, where when demand suddenly comes up, it takes a while for the supply to follow it, and then it comes yeah. down, and it's kind of why for months, you, you would have to meet somebody in an alley to buy toilet paper, and now they've got it going four cases high down the middle of the store, because it's doing this. Yeah. So, but now, what, what my understanding is, though, that the yeah, supplies, what I read was, we, we're not going to see the supply chain come back to normal in building supplies until 2023. Yeah, that's about right. It's going to, to be normal again, yes. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I totally see that happening. There's another thing. There are other countries that build a lot of parts and pieces for electrical supplies, and one of them is India. India is going through a terrible COVID uh, disaster right now, and their country is shutting down. The resins and stuff are all made there. Uh, we should feel very lucky that the U.S. is on an upswing from the COVID and the vaccines are available to us because in those countries, the people can't afford them. They can't get their hands on them. And now they're going through mm -hmm. these big uh, disasters again, these terrible yeah, things. Kidding. And that's shutting the supply, too, because they are an important uh, supplier of all kinds of goods throughout the world economy. Yeah, we are we, we are one big community now. And, and that's, you know. Even if we brought all the manufacturing back to America, there would still be components still coming on ships from other places for us to make things yeah. because that's just not how not how things work anymore. And you can wish no, for that. It, but... it didn't for a long time since World mm -hmm. War II and we bust, you know, Japan and Germany. I mean, we, we have been building this worldwide economy for almost 100 years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can wish for it to be like it used to be, but, you know, you'd sound like me talking about the way radio used to be. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'll talk that way. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yes. And my, and my kids, okay. you know, this morning I tried emailing something to my daughter and it, and, and it bounced back. I said to her, hey, my, my, my email came back. What's the deal? She said, you doing this? I had one letter missing in her address. And she says, yeah. dad, do you want me to come over and reset the internet for you too? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I said, could you do that? <laughs> okay. All right. Last question for you today, Tom, comes from Vernon in Houston. He says, I'm looking to purchase a portable generator and wondering if you have brand suggestions or ones that work best. He wants your advice. And I know we both have um, Kohler generators and um, our buddies at Kiss Generators, but I'm sure you have more to say about it than that. Well, it, but he says portable. And Charlie, yours and I are not portable generators. So if he's mm -hmm. looking for a whole house emergency backup system, whether it's as big as yours or 
a little more modest, modest like mine, the Kohler line is fantastic. And you gotta make sure you have the service plans and the maintenance done on it. And I know you have great results with yours and I do too. If you have one of the other brands, you still gotta do the maintenance and keep them going. But the Kohler brands for the whole house ones are great. Now, when you get into portable ones, the smaller ones that run on gasoline, that's a little different. And if that's what they're talking about, the industry has always been probably uh, more reliant on the Honda generators as, uh, as opposed to all the other ones out there. And there's a bunch of them. And you can buy no-name brands and the Briggs and & Stratton engines on there. And it's a pretty simple device. But those Hondas are incredibly uh, dependable and more quiet, at least with my experiences. So if you wanted to buy a really good portable generator like we use on job sites, or you could use under you know quick emergencies at your home to uh, supply some things, I take a look at the Hondas because even the refurbished ones, they're just built really well. Mm -hmm. And they have a new one out right now. There's a new Honda generator out there that is so yeah. quiet you can be standing yeah. next to it and not know it's running. You know, I just unlike, saw the whole history of Mr. Honda, and it was fascinating. Right. after World War II, where he he built this company. But anyway, if yes. you want to see something fun about Honda, go on to YouTube. Yes. And search Impossible Dream. And there's a video on there that I think it's Robert Goulet sings it. It's singing the Impossible Dream. And it's a progression from little mini motorbike up to jet Bicycles, boats yeah. to, to hot air balloons. All the other things that Honda's been in over the years. It's a great little video for you. So, all right. Well, that is all the questions we have this week, Tom. I know you and okay. I are going to wrap this up and we're going to stay on off offline here and record uh, a whole bunch of ask tom videos because that's tom likes us to post a new one every day because we like to help you with projects around your house and if you'd like to get in on that go over and click on that blue ask tom button over there and uh, fill out that form and send it in and uh, we'll be able to answer what, what's that he's gone already um <laughs> uh he'll uh yeah Dan, look at danny he's uh Oh, I know, I like the hair silhouette. It's nice. Yeah, see, I think what happens, whatever is in his closet came out. But anyway, <laughs> whatever took that door off. Anyway, but yeah, that, that was is a great uh, backdrop. <laughs> yeah, but that's he has two it's teenage daughters. Great backdrop. He has two Danny. teenage daughters. I don't want to hear the story. But anyway, <laughs> so anyway. But go ahead and send your questions. Be happy to take them. And of course, Tom will be on the radio this weekend. Yeah. Saturday 9 to 12 and Sunday 8 to 11 on Sports Radio 610. Of course, and he will Danny, be Saturday 7 to 9. Yeah, 7 to 9. The Garden Pros will be on and uh, we'd yep. be happy to hear from you. By the way, if you're looking for pros, people you can trust in the Houston area, visit homeshowradio.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll find all of our pros right there on our homepage. And if you're not sure what pro you're looking for, but you know what help you need, we have them organized by category there for you as well. And that'll help you um, get around and get things done. And we are done. And we'll be back again next Thursday at 4 o'clock Central Time. Um, if you're coming in late, you want to see this, you don't want to wait till next week, we rebroadcast this Friday nights at uh, 9 o'clock. And so uh, if you're watching this Friday night at nine o'clock, <laughs> this was recorded. Um, <laughs> so. And you had nothing else to do. <laughs> That's OK. Or you just wanted to to feast on Relax. the sumptuous banquet of knowledge that is any time you get to spend with go. Tom Tynan. So we will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Got a question. Ask Tom on Home Show. from a pro